Video games, Peter Brown. Hello, <laughs> and welcome to the lobby. GameSpot's weekly hangout every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, right here on GameSpot.com. Hello to all our friends in the Twitch chat as well. And hello to all our ear friends listening <laughs> in a podcast nearby. How are your ears doing, Peter Brown? They're all right. Have they been squished? You've cauliflower ear because of all this Oculus Rift Vive stuff you've been doing. I will say the Vive is digging into my ears. I could not get those straps to fit properly. Gone is digging into my hip. Man. You love that joke. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> is it less comfortable? We're, we're actually going to get to that later on. No, but let's just jump right in. Is it less comfortable than the I think the so. Rift? Really? Yeah, but let's let's talk about that one. In a little while. Comes, yeah. Good point, because Scott Butterworth's yeah. here, and yeah, hey. you have played a game. I did. Let's just jump right into that. You've played a game that a lot of people want to play. It's not out for yeah. a month, and it feels like it's been coming out for Yeah, we'll got delayed twice, so... Mm. Uncharted 4, mm. it's like finally coming out next month, and I got to play it last week. So how much did you get to play? I only got to play one mission, so it was like 20, 25 minutes worth of gameplay. Cool. Um, but it showed off sort of various aspects of the game. It was kind of a nice little just um, portion of the game that showed mm. off each of the you know individual aspects that's going to play a larger role in the overall experience. So there was some traversal, some exploration, a lot of like driving around a 4x4, four four, right. uh, and then like a nice combat section at the end. So I got a little taste of everything the game has to offer. Cool. Uh, so it, was that the part that they just released the gameplay for this week with the sort of the Jeep and the mountain yes. in the background? And exactly. So I got to really play cool. that myself Sweet. last week and captured some footage. So the footage that we have up on our site currently, half of it is stuff that I captured and half of it is from the official footage that they released. Okay. Um, it's a pretty so long demo that they released, actually about 16 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a little longer because I just kind of like explored around. Like a lot of that footage kind of cuts out the optional side areas that they right. just kind of like breeze past because I guess they want you to find them for yourself when you play the game. But yeah, the, the game clearly has more exploration now. There's just like little side pockets and uh, journal entries you can pick up. And like, you know, there are the same kind of collectibles that have always existed in the franchise, but there's kind of more like story content to discover on the side right. now. Um, I mean, like the, the way I framed my whole preview for, for what I played last week was how The Last of Us has influenced Uncharted. And, and for me, yeah. one of the, the most obvious obvious ways is the way that Uncharted now treats sort of the quieter moments in between combat, which have sort of always been there, but were never the focus. It was just sort yeah. of like, like, oh yeah, okay, then this thing happens and let's get on to the next set piece. Now it's, they really kind of like embrace those portions and almost expand them. And, and they do that in a gameplay way by allowing to explore more, but they also use those moments to like fill in characters' backstories and just have people right. kind of bantering and it allows you to connect with the characters in a human way because it's not just like gunfire all the time. Mm. They'll be talking about why they're there and sort of their relationship and then just idle chatter as well, just kind of joking around. Yeah. And it makes you feel very like... They feel more familiar. It feels like you're more at home with these characters. So uh, it was kind of cool the way that they, they've done that. Uh, scroll back in the chat says the chatter back and forth in the video for this was so good. The amount of like incidental dialogue they seem to have in this game is... Like, almost like I don't trust it until I see the full <laughs> game because they were just chit-chattering. Like, there was one part in the demo where you drove through a waterfall and, like, Sully gives out to you because it's like, he, he yeah. said, you've just got, like, got me. You could have given me warning before you did that. There were quite a few moments like that, including several that do not appear anywhere in the footage that's online. It was just stuff that I happened to see during my playthrough. Cool. So, there, yeah, there's, I mean... They clearly have written a great deal of dialogue and, and other types of character interactions that, you know, it, there's a good chance you will not see all of them because mm. they are sort of ambient. They just occur naturally as you play and you might not do a thing that triggers a particular conversation. Um, and also I've noticed that, um, for example, if, if two characters are conversing and I stopped the Jeep and got out and went to explore something, they would acknowledge that I was stopping and getting out. They'd be like, oh, okay, I guess you're not interested. And like, just give Drake a hard time. And then when I got back into the Jeep, the conversation would continue. They'd be like, so anyway, and then just pick up where the conversation wow. It, there's a pretty sophisticated kind of conversation system happening in mm. the background that, again, to me, feels like it's borrowed from Last of Us because there were a lot of those moments of like Joel and Ellie just kind of walking somewhere and using those com you know commuter moments mm. as an opportunity for storytelling. Um, so it's interesting that they have really kind of leaned into that and, and at least in the portion that I played, did a really excellent job of fleshing that kind of stuff out. And yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if they can keep that up for the whole experience. Mm. But I mean, it's, it's Naughty Dog. I mean, if, if there's a developer I have faith yeah. in to accomplish this, they're probably the team to do it. Yeah. It sounds like one of those games that's perfect for those old like sound test things in like the menu of the game where you can just cycle through and play all the sound effects. <laughs> yeah. Just like on a on a Genesis car. So like yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Streets of Rage, just yeah. go one through one. <laughs> 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 that's except, good, Peter. Thank yeah. You. Except they used to do that when there was like twelve sounds in the game. Right. <laughs> it's probably a bit more now. What's the yeah, Peter will know this. Like what was the size of like the Sega sound file where like you start yeah. up your Genesis and it goes, Sega like that apparently took up a huge amount of space on every cartridge. Really? Isn't that a thing? That's yeah, that's amazing. what I've heard that like that that 
audio file on its own was often as big as the game that was on the cartridge. <laughs> I don't Requested. know. If, really? You're I, well, the, I, I, figured I can't you would verify know. it. I can't verify right, it. Okay. Well, might be right. I'm we'll sorry to, to put you on the spot we'll like that. To, no, no, no. Peter is like our resident historian, so I yeah. assume that like if anybody knew... We'll, we'll do some research for that I'm next I'm surprised week. I haven't heard about this yeah. before. Um, the chat might know. The chat... Managed. Fill us in. This is a thing. I swear this is a thing. Uh, we, we should fill them in on Uncharted, though, more importantly. I want to ask another question about yeah. this, which is, I guess, like, you talk about your Last of Us sort of, uh, you know, comparison, which is, you know, it's a uh, sort of an easy comparison to make because that's what they just made. Yeah, yeah it's their and most also, recent game. And also, it was a sort of a, like a tonal shift from the from what we've seen in the Uncharted series, which are games where you're basically killing loads and loads and loads of people. And one of the things in The Last of Us, which they tried to, like, delicately balance was, you know, how horrible it is that Joel has to murder all and Ellie has to have to murder all these people um which was it's like a different balancing act that like some games have done worse than others like Bioshock Infinite was one of those games that just felt like two different games with the story and the combat like is there an element of that in here where like they're fleshing out these characters and they're having this lovely little road trip and then they're again murdering like 15 20 20 people at a base Did I mean there's there's definitely still a disconnect as there is in many shooters where you're you know killing an inordinate number of people I mean that, I think that was part of what allowed it to feel kind of realistic in in the last of us the, the number of enemies you were killing was substantially lower so in addition to right. going out of their way to justify like here's why you have like this is you're fighting for survival like you really like they will murder you you have to kill them and mm. like it really you know enforces that idea but also there were fewer people to kill so it felt believable uncharted still killing a ton of dudes <laughs> like the combat section at the end there were at least a dozen guys that you just kind of gunned down and then drake is immediately all like quippy and happy again so there is a disconnect but i mean like that that's always been there and I feel like that's true of a lot of shooters. It's it's an interesting topic that's worth exploring, but mm. I, I don't know that it's like a huge problem for Uncharted. It, it still has the same tone. It's not like it's become a drastically more dramatic game as mm. a result of having been influenced by The Last of Us. It, the, the tone feels very much in line with the rest of the series. It's a, you know, it's a pulpy action experience. There's like explosions and like funny jokes, things like that. Are um, they funny? Are they actually funny jokes? So far, yeah. I laughed a couple of times during the, the gameplay thing I All watched right. anyway. Yeah, there Especially really... like Sco uh, Solly giving out about the winch the whole way through the process yeah, and then eventually they have the to time. use the winch because he, he had to pay more to get the car with the winch and he was like we're never going to use it and then eventually they use it and he's like that's only one that's like one one time we've used yeah. it like i didn't have a problem with the winch i had a problem with paying more for the winch <laughs> yes i mean there's nothing that's like laugh out loud hilarious because it's really not that kind of game but it's the kind of stuff that like makes you relate to the characters just kind of smile and you know, it, there's this sense of camaraderie mm. among them that, that uh, you know, at least it won me over, at mm. least, and mm. it, in the same way that previous Uncharted games have. Yeah. It looks gorgeous, too. It is a very good looking game, mm. yes. Uh, I don't know that it's like, it's the best looking game of all time, but it's, yeah, it's the, the step up from Uncharted 3, which obviously was a PlayStation 3 game, very noticeable. Mm. This is a gorgeous game, especially relative to previous franchise entries. So I think players can at least look forward to it being a very good looking mm. game, if nothing else. Uh, these, I guess, base elements, base invasion elements at the end of it, where you, there are all these, you know, this is essentially an outpost with a bunch of dudes in it, and you sort of have to take them on. Take them on. Like, hard to separate that from games that have come out in the past couple of years, especially like last year with Metal Gear Solid, in terms of, oh, I wonder how I'll be able to tackle this. Was there elements of stealth in oh, this? Oh, totally. Did, did they work well? Like, like once you're seen, is it just like everyone knows you're there? Like how do, how is it how does it work? Yeah, it, it is basically like once you've been detected, like that's it. Like all hell breaks loose. There's nothing you can do about it. You're mm. now in a firefight. But yeah, there are, are total Metal Gear vibes to the way that combat works now. It's not drastically different from mm. the way that it worked in previous entries, but now there is an extra layer of stealth on top. That's it's basically optional. I mean, if you want to just charge in, you can go ahead and drive your four x four straight into battle and like not care. Mm. But uh, there are now <laughs> tools that it's players can utilize to sort of plan their attack a little more <laughs> or thoroughly or like right. find a way to give themselves the upper hand. So like just to give you a quick overview, there are now uh, there's, um, uh, indicators above enemies' heads that let you know if they've noticed you. It'll start to fill up if you're sort of in their sight line. And once it turns yellow, they'll start searching for you actively in a sort of Assassin's Creed kind of way. Mm. Once they spot you, then that's when combat starts. But if they're just sort of yellow and they're kind of suspicious, you can still like hide or you can stealth take them out before they notify everybody else that, hey, Drake's here, let's go yeah. kill him and stuff. Um, so you do have the option to take a more stealthy approach this time. Um, again, you don't have to, but it's it's kind of cool that they have at least equipped players who want to play that way with the tools to do mm. it. 
And how did the Jeep feel, actually? Considering it looks like we've yeah. seen two sort of long demos and both of them had a lot of driving in them. Yeah, it is interesting that they've really committed to the Jeep, but it, it handles well. Uh, again, it just feels kind of like an opportunity for them to, you know, imbue the game with a little more storytelling mm. and just give you kind of something else to do when you're traversing between combat moments. And, and it allows for uh, more free exploration. I mean, they, they've talked a lot about how this is the largest uh, Uncharted, both in terms of the length of the game, but also in terms of the size of the environments. Mm. And at least in my experience, that has proven true. Like the, the hills of Madagascar that I was driving through were definitely, it was definitely a very substantial area. They, they refer to it as wide linear. So it is funneling you in a particular <laughs> direction. <laughs> But Wide there's a lot linear. of space to explore as you're heading in that direction. Yeah. So I, I absolutely share Peter's eye roll, but <laughs> it did it did prove true for yeah. me at least that there was a lot of area that you could potentially explore. Peter is now making faces. The podcast people are missing out I love on that. Peter's excellent expressions of disdain. Everyone's missing out. What's We're your pointing the camera at me? No <laughs> What's your favorite wide linear game of 2015? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, uh, it's not quantum break. It's not quantum break. Yeah. No. Oh yeah. We'll get to that actually Sweet. in a little bit. Uh, final thoughts, I guess, on it, Scott. It's coming out May tenth on the PlayStation Four. Yeah, it's 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 finally happening. I guess the the last thing I'll say is that I also got a chance to interview Neil Druckmann, right? Who is both the director, creator, creative lead on Last of Us and the creative director on Uncharted Four. And just talking to him gives me a lot of faith in the game. I really like his very thoughtful approach to making games. Uh, he very much has a storyteller's mind. And for me, that's really important. I know a lot of gamers don't really care about story. They will skip cutscenes and whatever. Mm. But I really like feeling like the uh, the gameplay has a purpose or like, I know what I'm doing and I have an incentive. Or, you know, being like, hey, flip the power switches and restore power to the gate is not nearly <laughs> as exciting as, hey, this character that you care about and are invested in is going to die unless you do something, go do it. Mm. That, to me, makes a game much more enjoyable. So his approach very much seems to cater to that type of game. And so, yeah, just having an opportunity to, to talk to him about all that stuff. Give me give me a lot of faith in the project. And yeah, just like where his head's at. Awesome. So people should definitely go check out that interview if they haven't already. It's up on the site. You, are you, thank you so much, Scott. Are you laughing about wide linear again? <laughs> no, he likes where his head's at. And I was like, on top of his shoulders? <laughs> <laughs> That's just because you've been playing virtual reality for the past uh, week. And your head has been <laughs> separated from the top of your shoulders. For all so, I know, yeah. So much. It is a funny phrase, though. You're, you're not wrong. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for coming on and telling yeah. us all about it. That's good. It, it sounds like... I was kind of wondering if there might be some like red flags waved with this one because like it's it's like tr well trodden ground now for the series, but yeah. it sounds like it's it's interesting. They, I mean, in talking to to the developers though, I talked to other developers besides uh, Neil Druckmann as well. Mm. But they seem fully aware that like yeah, this is the fourth installment, and we needed to like do something different and kind of go bigger and really give this series the send off it deserves. Yeah. So they're aware of the fact that yeah, this is we've done this before and we got to do something different. So again, I think that's kind of where the storytelling and the exploration are coming from. That it, it just adds another dimension to the game that was always kind of present but was never fully explored. So yeah, I mean, everything I've seen of the game gives me faith that it will be a worthwhile experience. I'm mm. not saying, oh, guaranteed 10 out of 10, but at this point, there were no real red flags. There's no reason to believe mm. that it's going to be like a total mess or anything like that. So yeah, I mean, I'm fingers crossed cool. that it all works out. Sweet. All right, let's shift gears a little bit here. Gentlemen, let's stop talking to you, Scott, for a second. Yeah, well, now talk, talk, talk to, to Peter. Peter, Peter Brown. Uh, <laughs> from games, I'm trying to think of some sort of connective tissue between these two franchises. Yeah. What are you thinking? Both have guns. What are you thinking? Both have guns. There you go. Both have male protagonists, third uh -huh. person. Both have time wizards. <laughs> maybe. maybe. <Was> it? No. <laughs> no. But there's always some weird, like, you know, there's always aliens or something in Uncharted games. That's true. So who and knows? There's God knows what's in. Quantum Break. Let's have a little chat, Peter Brown. Yeah. Let's have a chat about Quantum Break. Yeah. Uh, six out of ten on GameSpot.com. Six out of ten. Two out of five on GiantBomb.com. Two out of five. <laughs> 8 out of 10 on IGN. 8.5 on Polygon and Game Informer. Jim starting as well. Digital Spy. Give it a sweet 5 out of 5. Really? Um, yeah, I, I want to talk about this because I've been playing Quantum Break for the past couple of weeks. And when your review was going through QA, I was like, yep. Yep, totally. And like talking to Jeff about it. He was like, I think probably a bit more down on the combat, but he like, was, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it was like, yeah, that that seems about right. And then I saw, and I know like our scale isn't as we we tend to use a lot more of it than the m most sites. But when I saw all the other reviews, I was like, wow, okay, I, yeah. I don't want to like cast any like any negative, you know, opinions towards 
any of those other reviewers because if they truly like the game that much, cool. But yeah. yeah, I was just, it was like, did I play a different game? <laughs> did I did I miss something here? Uh, but yeah, I, I be, people are having very different reactions yeah. to this. And it's interesting to me that, like I, I had spoken to Jeff a little bit about his opinion, but mm. it was but it was mostly like the day before publishing the review because I was like, I'm really anxious. People are going to get really upset with me and I just need to know, are you in line with me? Because if you're mm. not, then I should be anxious. But yeah. he was like, no, I'm not. Like, okay, I'm not alone. But then it turns out we are alone. <laughs> me and him are the two that are the outliers and we work in the same building. And uh, I don't, I don't know what people see in this game. Like they, a lot of people described the similar, same problems that I had with it. Mm. Which are, which are oh. like, <laughs> Let's get into it a little bit for context uh, yeah. for other people. I, I, I don't want to just rattle off a list. It deserves yeah. more explanation. Um, so where would you like me to begin? Pick a... <laughs> Pick let's an aspect of the game, and I will tear it to bits. Okay, let's talk about the most <laughs> the most important thing about the game, which is the movement combat, moment to moment gameplay in terms of like what you're actually doing and controlling the main character. Yes, movement feels like you've got twenty pound weights on each one of your feet, or maybe like you're going through mud. Maybe mm. that's more accurate. It is slow. It is unresponsive. It is loose, and you know you're getting into combat scenarios where yeah, you have these time powers that help you uh, you know move around quickly get uh, advantages on the battlefield and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, there are moments when that's taken away from you. Mm. And you have to resort to using just your basic mobility. And it, it becomes so clear at that point that something is missing. And that something that's missing extends to when you take cover. Like this is a game that, yeah, maybe you don't want to call it a cover shooter, but you're lying to yourself. Because yeah. anytime you go up to anything that is waist high, you duck behind it automatically, aka you take cover. Mm. Um, like most of the engagements in this game yeah. involve you taking cover or if not running from cover to cover, like it is right. absolutely a cover. Right. It's imperative because the only way to recharge your, your time abilities, which allow you to do various things mm -hmm. is to take a break and let them, you know, it's a cooldown timer, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and your health recharges as well. Same thing. So you just, you go hide, you get some health back, you get your powers back and you keep going. Um, but when you can't use your powers and you want to use your gun from cover, you don't have, you don't have the ability to blind fire. Yeah. You have to stand up, no matter what, to fire your weapon. <laughs> Therefore, exposing yourself. I, I'm gonna pull no punches here. It is ridiculously stupid that that was a design decision that made it into this game. And like, I remember, I remember idiotic. you said it to me, and I thought, oh, this never came up for me. And then later that day, three times, somebody flanked me, and I couldn't just shoot them crouching. I had to stand up and let eight people shoot at me. It was, I like, it was maddening. I don't even want to hear the argument that this game isn't designed to be a shooter, mm. because then why the hell do I have guns, and why the hell am I forced to use them at some point? And I also that happened to me way before I got any of the other powers, which kind of mitigate that, like the ability to like run fast yeah, into no, a different but, area. Yeah, no, but dude, later in the game, there are these machines that literally strip you of your powers right yeah, yeah yeah it's not even that you don't have access to new things you don't have anything you got nothing mm. but your guns and the fact that you have to get shot just to shoot somebody when you're trying to protect yourself and i'm totally with you on the movement and like even the aiming everything about it just feels like you know that kill zone thing that's like the easiest yeah. delta is that people say like kill zone you felt very heavy and the aiming was yeah. was heavy or whatever um i like actually for whatever reason, I actually was fine with Killzone. I was fine with Grand Theft Auto 4, which is another one that people say. Killzone 3 was pretty good. <laughs> right? <laughs> but this one was something about... It just feels... Yeah, it does yeah. not feel like, oh, this was meant to be a shooter first. No, it's... it's it's Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think it is necessarily, but right. there's a, that's a very strong component of it. And uh, the aim assist feature is turned on by default, and yeah. I turned it off, and me I was too. like, no, I need it. Mm. Like, I'm ineffective without it, and I don't think it's because of me. Like, I feel like it's because... Like the game presents you with scenarios with a certain level of stress and threat. You have to react within a certain amount of time. And this game just doesn't really afford you the ability to do so with any amount of skill. Yeah. You, so at that point, the auto aim just becomes like a thing you need. Mm. And the, the, the powers themselves, although like you can sort of guess what they are. There's like a bubble shield which helps you regenerate. There's one that like stops them in a time bubble so that yeah. you can load them full of bullets. But like none of, they all seem disparate. Like none of them connect to each other or you can't really chain them in any sort of interesting way. I So I, I think Jeff described a similar thing to mm. me, but I, I kind of disagree. Like I, I found a really good rhythm during combat. Um, wh while you can upgrade your powers and the differences aren't incredibly noticeable, uh, when it comes to the moment to moment stuff of chaining different moves together, being able to increase the frequency with which you use an ability during a, a charge uh, made a difference for me. So I was able to, you know, zip across the field, cap a time shield, uh, cast a time shield, you know, 
put a bubble out there, shoot that guy on my shield ran out, zip somewhere else behind cover. And then, you know, just kind of like mix those abilities together. And yeah. I found that to be pretty fun. The, the combat is pretty easy. Hmm. Your powers are, they make you very OP. The game only goes so far as to introduce, you know, big bad guys that have a weak point in their back. Yeah. <laughs> um, which and they're are not that difficult to take down. They're not that difficult to take down, but, but the their AI is... Their AI is... Points glow. <laughs> they don't, but they're, bright, they're yellow. They're bright yellow. Oh, yeah. Okay. And they have the same uh, Monarch logo on absolutely everything in this video. Yeah. It is funny. Yeah, literally everything is a giant <laughs> logo um, on yeah. it. <laughs> We're the bad guys. I know, Thanks. Totally. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even uh, the security guards have like these hoodies with M... Um, like sewn into yeah, them. Yeah, like what the hell? I don't know, maybe we're getting the picky here, but like, no, what we're not. No, we're so not. That, that's hor That's, dude, come on. No, that's awful. It's, <laughs> it's like, not. It's not the real world. They're trying to present this really dramatic situation set in the real world where people actually have real life problems yeah. that are a part of the grander struggle in this fantasy, and then they have goofy henchmen. It's just like, yeah, just pull you right out of the experience. So the, the other, like, like sort of the main, like, or the main dramatic pull in this game, I'm not sure if we should talk about this necessarily, is the fact, like, the time is going to end. For one reason or another, it's kind of a, it, like, I, I never felt worried the time was going to end at any stage during this game. The op <laughs> the, I know, it's just, yeah, I know, there's like a spoiler. I, it's literally the first thing that happens in the game, so let's talk, talk about it. But, like, even the, then, like, the main thing you should be worried about in this game is stripped gets away thrown from out the window, yeah. like, almost yes. immediately. Yes, I, at, at no point did I have any investment of whatever dread was being communicated to me on screen by the characters. Yeah. It felt so contrived. In fact, <laughs> there was one part of, uh, actually where the uh, there was so much emotion out of the character because he was about to like leave this mission we'd done, and he got up, to, he got went up to like a valet's like key, yeah, like you know where all puts all the keys, and he's like, yeah, and he's like <laughs> valet box every car thief's dream and he like picks one, he's like, yeah, <laughs> and like gets in a Ferrari or whatever and drives off, and it's like. Dude, you just murdered a bunch right. of people, and also, isn't time about to end? Like, why are you <laughs> just being this like cool cat? Yeah, no, I mean, and yeah, I guess I ties back with the, the Uncharted thing we so, talked about. <laughs> so the, the the thing about this is, what I want to talk about is that like obviously people rated the game differently, right? Yes, they and did. I'm just interested why because it's so broadly different. And to me, this is a game that is very like I'm right with you where it is fine. It is. The main reason I think that it comes off as more than fine is that it's really well presented. Oh, yeah. Like, it looks great. One of the best-looking games of the year. And, like, it's got, you know, decent, like, voice act, even though, like, the scripting isn't particularly great. There's right. something, like, you know, qualitative, qualitative, qualitatively, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> good about it. It just, it feels like money's been pumped into it and effort has been played. Yeah. Put in, even if it hasn't resulted in something great. So, like, even the TV show, it's kind of this plodding, ridiculous mess, but I kind of love it because it's so weird. Like, I love it because it's, and I, I loved it less every time I had to watch an episode. Yeah. I'll say that. And yeah. It's less and less interesting, and none of the characters seem to have anything to do with the main story, really, in any way. But, I feel like a lot of people rated it really well because it looks nice. Like it's because it comes across as a game with a big budget and lots of like yeah, I know I noticed effort a lot. behind it. Even if it's actually just like a you know it's right. a, not a well polished turd. I don't want to say that it's a fine game, but it's not it's not a great game by any means. No, it's a game that came out ten years ago. Yeah, I mean I, I saw people dumping on the game, dumping on the show, you know, calling them middling, hmm. and then me like, but oh man. I've never seen a game do something like this before. <laughs> and that and that influenced their assessment. And you know, if that actually made them enjoy the experience more, that's totally fair. Hmm. I it's the same reason I can't give a game kudos just for being in VR. You know, it's there are doing something novel is only good when it's put to good use. Hmm. And here I don't think it was put to good use. Did you like Alan Wake? I didn't play Alan Wake. Okay. So I really liked Alan Wake. Yeah. Because it kind of struck this interesting narrative, like chord at me, and I was like, "Oh, okay, like I'm in, I'm in with this guy. Like it's kind of crazy what's happening, and it's cleverly written, and all this. And like this feels like they tried to take the sort of charming, you know, nuanced storytelling of Alan Wake and apply it to like a mainstream audience with more CSI style yeah. television stuff. And it's it's just like not there's soulless. There's it's just no not nuance. It's basically no. like guess what, time is in play yeah. and weird stuff's going to happen and you're not really going to know what's now or later or the before. Go have fun. Like, But that's <laughs> that's kind of the extent of it. Like, It's all this this doubling back on what you thought you knew because time travel is a thing. Yeah. Oh, I, am I completely wrong or does the whole time 
broken thing also feel like a massive MacGuffin in that like it never actually right. makes any like there's no through line. Like it just seems to be like at certain points time uh, time did something and yeah. then it's just to serve the narrative. Like yeah. I don't feel at all like I feel like somebody's going to take this story and break it down and be like none of this has any consistency. <laughs> like maybe I'm wrong. Maybe loads of thought went into it, but even now I don't like I have no because you know, I haven't completed it yet. I'm right. I'm yeah. near enough the end, but like. I feel like there's. I don't have any clue what the rules of this world are. They it's really, just like press Y here to make right. the bridge go back so you can walk across it. But oh like, God. why can't I do that everywhere then? Why does it only happen in places which are part of your platforming thing? Why, like it's, why can you only use your powers in some sections but not others? There were hmm. times where I was in an environment looking for a clue and it was like, okay, the room is so big and I walk so slow, I'd love to zip over there. Oh, I can't use my powers now? Not because oh, really? there's a device like in combat that, that negates <laughs> it. The game just decides, yeah, you don't need those right now. We want you to walk over there and we want you to move slow enough mm. that you notice the other items in the environment. And it's so sad that a game which takes such a... And I th feel like it sounds like we're being very critical, but we are. we're also... We are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, yeah, I guess it, it just feels like it's kind of a missed opportunity. Is that the other thing about this game that feels crazy old? That, like, how can you have this many pick like a narrative objects in a world that are just pages and pages of text yeah i it, like it, oh gosh the story does not at least for me it did not warrant the amount of time that it required for me to like get the finer details of the characters and their plot mm. arcs and the story it was to me just a ham-fisted way to take the characters from the show and put their stories into the game mm. you know apart from any sort of social or professional connections that they had to the main characters. Like you'd find it, an email from the dude that's only in the show and it's forever long. You know? Yeah. And you read one and you're like, okay, that was kind of interesting. Oh, geez, there's like 10 more in this room. <laughs> I think I'm going to move on. I think I'm going to walk away from that. Yeah. But then I talked to some people who were telling me like, oh, did you find this one thing? Oh, it was great. And it's like, I, I believe it. I wish I had found that, but it got lost in a sea of dribble. Yeah. I thought. I also, I'm a big fan of the Remedy TV show stuff they do. Yeah. And the stuff in this one just wasn't, I found like three of them so far, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just not great either. It's kind of like, oh, you guys are better than this, maybe. But yeah, and I, and I would really like to talk about the distribution of activities as I constantly refer to it as. So this game is a TV show. This game is combat. This mm -hmm. game is narrative sequences and it is platforming. Yes. And it's basically all divided evenly. Mm. So the one thing in the game that it does incredibly well is, well, not, maybe not incredibly well. The one thing the game does well is combat. Right. Second to that is the, sort I agree. Of the, yeah. the, the, the storytelling stuff that happens b between action sequences mm. when you're walking with the character from one point to another. And even though you're not doing anything special, you're just walking, I found that to be a good break to just sort of like take in some exposition and dialogue yeah. between these characters. Very well produced those sections as well. Like there's yeah. a reason why they showed basically that's all they ever showed in previews right. when they were showing it at events for years. Right. And that stuff is cool. Yeah. But then, you know, you expect, okay, I just got through this story. I'm ready for more action. And then you got to do some platforming. And it's like, mm. oh, you got to find the dumpster to climb onto the roof, to jump over to the next roof, to cl climb down the ladder, mm. you know. And make time go backwards before the building was built. Walk in and make time go forward. Done. Yeah, but you only have five <laughs> seconds to do it and you have to wrestle with the horrible mobility controls to mm. get the thing done in time. But it's all it's also all scripted. So you can only climb certain objects. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Even though there's something that would make your path simpler yeah. to complete. No, this, this game is screwed up, man. Like yeah. There, there's one thing where you had to rewind time to make a van back yes. out of a tunnel. So this, I was, when you said that, I literally thought there's a part where, yeah, I wanted to just jump on the van. But yeah. no, I have you to do this whole thing to make there it. There's a van that is seven feet tall. You are a freaking time wizard. You've done. You've climbed on top of things taller than that in the game. You can't just climb up on the van. You have to reverse time so it can back up, so you can jump off of a roof to get on top of it. Yeah. Like illogical BS. I. I when a game does stuff like that, it, it to me it assaults my intelligence. Right. Yeah. And it assaults my time because it's like, look, I am not here to do this basic shit yeah <laughs> give me some give me some like make me feel like you understand what makes a good game mm. don't pad it out with things that nobody wants to do and nobody will believe is like a thing that has to be handled in that way yeah it's just it's so padded with bs did you say insult your intelligence or assault your intelligence i said yeah. assault i was just yeah that's a much more powerful <laughs> phrase yeah yeah that's a good seriously so, <laughs> it's like a writer or something so if people want to see the full review alan wake or alan wake sorry quantum break <laughs> is out today quantum wake quantum Look. wake yeah uh, uh, quantum break is out today I, uh, I think it's gonna be very interesting to see what like people who buy it i'm looking at metacritic user reviews are mostly 10 
Really? Yeah. Well, like mm. that's, I know it's like been out for like six hours. Well, that's but. Xbox One owners who right. this is like one of their only sort of big games is coming right. out, and it does look really good on Xbox One. Yeah, like for all the complaint, you know, complaints, complaints we have. Version, it's yeah. You know, the game looks great. Mm. It has some good moments, both Shoot, for some the of the story and the cool. gameplay. Yeah. yeah, but like the the mesh that holds it all together is fractured yeah. in far too many places. It's just unreliable. It's a very widely linear game. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> listen, Peter. The only thing I want to know: uh, Are there and what is the quality of the time puns in the game? Oh, no. Oh, I don't remember any. There's which, lots. Because really, lots, there, there, there lots. ought to be. Yeah. Uh, we, do they actually, break the fourth wall and like wink at the camera? Because I don't remember any of that. We're they running do, out of time. They Maybe literally was, do that all the time. Oh, man. There's but like, I'm not sure if they mean it half the time. There's one more point we have to address. Okay. <laughs> the last fact last that, point. Other than time puns. The fact that this game is designed to provide multiple paths for you to pursue and thus encourage you to replay the game. Yeah. The things that change are so minor yeah. that again, it's like an insult to like you game, as a person. Game like, has the same ending no matter what. Game it, yeah. Some characters are swapped out. Some, yeah, but like, none of it, yeah, but none of it ties happen. into like your story yeah. for the most part. It, it's just, oh, it's just trite differences that mean nothing. So there you go. Yeah. Quantum Break, six out of ten on GameSpot.com. Check out the review. It's a real fair game. One. Real fair, super fair. <laughs> it's a super fair game. Uh, if you've played it yourself, let us. And time has passed, and you haven't just burned through it in your fanboy. Let us know what you think uh, in the comments below. Uh, but yeah, very interesting to see see what the, the fallout will be from this one. Uh, Mr. Butterworth, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. We're gonna swap you out. Uh, yes. Who's it? Rob Handler? He's coming in. Robert Perfect. Handler. Uh, come on in, Rob. Let's get you in. Uh, we've got a bunch more. We have a ton of stuff yeah. to talk about today actually uh how you doing rob so good you doing all right super super good how you doing <laughs> pretty good. it's good to see you without your vive googly eyes on yeah uh, finally no uh, i love that segment you guys are awesome that was so much fun <laughs> that thing's cool uh we're gonna talk about some video games with you rob in a hot second fallout 4 and the the doom beta as well the beta <laughs> for our friends in the uk uh but first of all let's we peter brown we had you on here last week to talk about the Oculus Rift. Hi. Thanks so much for coming in. Hi. You've played a lot of <laughs> VR games. And then the Vive okay. came along and yeah. we had to play more of that. So you've played the Vive now, it seems like, for a good week and change. Well, we we only got it on Wednesday. Well, we had like a... We had, we like had a, a pre-production one. Yeah. I didn't put too much time in with that because I figured, oh, I'll wait for the final one. They're identical. Yeah. <laughs> but I've used it a lot at previous events. So yes, I, I am experienced. And our review went up on GameSpot.com today, I believe. This morning. Excellent. Cool. So let's dive into this a little bit. First of all, first things first, direct comparison between the two of them. Hmm. Hard to make considering you know controllers are involved in one and, and the price points and all that sort of stuff. But what are you feeling at the moment as somebody who, if you just had access to both of them, which one would you go for? If I had access to both of them right now, um, not someone who's trying to come up with a feature or a review mm. or like a cold comparison, right? Like just a real human decision, I would choose Rift. Really? Yeah. And why is that? Far easier to set up, far easier and more comfortable to actually use for extended periods of time. And I felt like I was able to jump into the store and identify games that were interesting to me. And unlike with Vive, I found fully realized games. Right. A lot of the stuff in Vive was, you know, currently is like tech demo type stuff, right? There's a game that's like, oh, selfie tennis. And you're like, oh, what's this tennis game? You <laughs> literally play tennis with yourself. Okay. You hit the ball the other side of the court, the camera jumps over, you hit it back. There's like Whoa. no menu. Oh, do you get There's sick? no goal. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, and yeah, an Oculus is, it's a far more elegant and refined product. Like it's, it's not, it doesn't have the same number of components or capabilities of Vive, but that's just right now. Right. Oculus is releasing their touch controllers later this year. They can do room scale VR. You just need a second sensor. Right. And when that happens, I think people are going to realize that that is the product that is the more user friendly by far. Mm. Just maybe not out the box has as much options. Let's, no. talk, let's talk about the setup stuff, first of all, because have you you set it up in multiple rooms, right? The Vive. I, I had Ocu well, Do you want me to do a comparison or just talk about Vive? Uh, Vive. Okay. So setting up Vive when you have enough space, the maximum playroom area is 15 by 15 mm. feet, but you can do it in less than that. But let's say you have 15 by 15 feet. It's very easy. Uh, granted, you have the ability to mount the two base stations, the, the things that project infrared light that is then picked up by the headset and the controllers. Um, do they have to be floating in the air somewhere? Do you have to like drill them into they a have wall? To, or? It's recommended that they're at least six and a half feet above the ground, although okay. I was able to set them up closer to like five feet mm. at home because um, I had to. Um, 
So you have to place those. You have to like trace your your room using one of the controllers, and it determines like, okay, you've got a big enough space, or oh, you need to do it again. Um, doing it at home, I could have sworn the space I had was bigger than the minimum r recommendation, which was five by six and a half feet. Right. But so you trace the room, and then it takes this virtual map and it puts it in what you traced, and it says, okay, it fits or it doesn't. It was overlapping by hair, and it was like, sorry, you don't have sufficient space to do this. Start right. over. Right. I had to do it like five, six times and basically lie and just move the controller a little bit like over the edge of my couch. And it was right. like, yeah, rock on, man. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this something that you have to then repeat every time? So you got parents coming over, and you got to take down the whole thing. Hmm. Uh, and do I have to like, do I have like a preset uh, mode it, or anything like that? If you move the base stations, you will have to do it again. Okay. Um, if you... For some reason, like the software gets disoriented, you have to do it all again. Because like there was one time where the floor had suddenly jumped, no matter what I was in, to like eye level. So I was like constantly looking like over the ground, <laughs> right? Um, because right. you put the controllers on the floor, and the base stations detect where the floor is. So you have to kind of go through some of that. If it gets messed up, the intention for these things is that they will be set up permanently. Mm. Um, Valve so confidently said, uh, you know, we find that people make room for VR, right? Which is like that's like such a subjective thing though. Like who knows? Right. Like, who has the yeah. room to make room for VR? Let Let's talk about the actual headsets themselves. And and I guess this is a comparison question. The Oculus feels a lot. Uh, uh, is it lighter or is it is it does it fit snugger than the Vive? What's going on there? So it's lighter. Um, the mix of materials is far better, especially when it comes to the straps. They on Rift they are sturdy in just the right place. Hmm. So when you go to put it on, it's. Uh, it's stiff enough that you don't actually have to like manhandle it too much. You mm. just hold on to it to just kind of control it, but it slips on like a like a stiff catcher's mask. Yeah. Vive um, has four cables coming out of the top compared to Oculus's one, which kind of comes out of the side, and its straps are really floppy. So when you go to put it on, the, the cables kind of like pressure it down. So you have to do this little dance to kind of put it on, which in reality, on its own terms, isn't that bad. But after using Rift for a week, where I got, I could just slip it on in like a second, yeah. it was a nuisance. It definitely felt like a nuisance. Did it get loose as you were using it or anything? No, or? no, it wasn't. No. They're not loose in that regard. They're just floppy, right? There's some rigidity to, to Rift straps. Um, but what did bother me too is that, and this is subjective because of my head, I, I, I guess, because no one else has told me this, but the straps on the side are really uh, wide. Okay. So whenever I put it on, it's either digging into my ears or overlapping them. Right. I could not get the headset to sit comfortably without that happening. Also, it doesn't come with its own headset, right? Uh, you mean headphones? Headphones, yeah, yeah. Right, no, it's got like a little plug that's dangling. And, and it comes with headphones that you can plug into that. But again, it's... It still feels like a prototype, hmm. you know, like Damn. Rift has these built in, they're easily adjustable, they're comfortable, they sound really good, honestly, for just what you, you know, packed in over your head or on your headphones, hmm. it sounds really well. Uh, so what about the quality of life sort of stuff that like the UI you use, yeah. trying to surface games that, that work well, because the, the Vive has access to like the whole Steam yeah. interface and whatnot, so yeah. is it difficult to find games that are working for, I, I kind of had assumed in my head that most of the games that were coming out on Rift are also coming out on Vive, but is that is that not the case? Okay, so with Vive, um, you work through Steam VR, which is sort of a, it like runs on the side of Steam. And it's like it's the big screen stuff almost. It's kinda, like using- Yeah, uh, it's similar to that. Um, but at the bottom of the screen when you're in the menu, you have the option to flip from Steam VR, Steam, or your desktop. Okay. And I really, really, really appreciated all of that. Hmm. Because, you know, you're looking at VR games and like that's all well and good. But like at the same time, like if you actually wanted, you know, if you're in Steam and something catches your eye, you think about something, you can go look it up. Mm. Um, if you get a notification on your desktop or, you know, whatever, you can actually go to your desktop and you use the controller as sort of like a laser pointer. Right. You point at things and you click with the trigger. Okay, how can uh, you type? Huh? How can you type? Uh, it's got, uh, the controller sort of opens up to the touchpad thing so you can use those to like okay. navigate like a split keyboard. Cool. Um, it works it, the experience of going to the PC works so well, and I didn't know how much I would appreciate it until mm -hmm. I started using it. Um, there was one error I noticed where uh, in Steam it have a video section, and so like you know things like Kung Fury or like a documentary on a game are on there, and I went to go play it as though it would pop up in like a theater mode. Yeah, Steam said it was doing that, but then I started hearing it, and I put off the headset, and it was playing on the monitor. Right. So there's still some kinks to be worked out. Um, but yeah, like you know, for Rift, it's a much si more simple experience. It is just the the, the um, Oculus Home uh, UI, and you can import videos and play them in like a theater. But that's the extent of what you can do outside of Oculus Home within Oculus Home. Mm. 
So do you think there's more room for improvement then in terms of like, because the Vive has access to all this whole Steam interface thing, does that seem like it works better with just your wider PC as a tool set? It does, provided that you are someone who is very familiar with Steam and, you know, what it's like to be a PC gamer, right? right. Like it's, it's not the sort of thing that I could hand to someone who doesn't play games and say, here figure this out. Like they're going to probably end up like in a menu somewhere and not realize what they did mm -hmm. to get there and or, or how to get out. Um, Rift on the other hand is super intuitive. Uh, technically in terms of, you know, resolution and all that sort of no, stuff. They're identical. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, did it feel any different in terms of eye space or like when you put right. them on? So the, the way that the optics are shaped in Vive is a little bit different than Rift. Rift is a, a smooth optical lens. Vive seems to have these, um, like steps. You notice, these hard circles that go around. Right. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. I'm sure there's some research to support that it, it helps. But I will say uh, images on the edge of the optics tended to blur a little bit in Rift. And this segmentation of the the, the optic, uh, I can't speak, <laughs> the optics in Vive uh, kind of negated that a little bit. Hmm. Adjusting the distance between lenses, um, you have sort of a, uh, a manual slider in, uh, in Rift and you can't, you don't always know, like if you give it to somebody else, you don't know where your place was. Vive has a dial that when you turn it, it actually shows you a distance like in a UI oh, like right. in a headset. So if it ever gets changed, you know, okay, my distance is this. Just go right back to that, mm. which is pretty awesome. That is useful. Yeah, the, the rift I was adjusting that, I was like, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah, right. I'll, I'll find somewhere yeah. that looks okay, but to know like, all right, let me see one, let me see two, yeah. let me see three. Yeah. We see one. <laughs> so it's weird. It's, nice. it's it's like they're sort of holistic. They they are doing a lot of the same well, but there's just like little parts. And I guess, you know, does it matter to you a lot to sort of the the build of the unit? Because it does. It does when it comes to it affecting comfort. Right. Like there there is a an angle to the strap of Rift that goes up and then around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because they clearly ran into somebody like me who can't have a strap coming straight out mm. because it digs into your ear. There's even a little like give so you can tilt Rift forward. Mm. Whereas Vive to do that, you have to essentially distend the strap. With Rift, it's just like a, a quick little tilt mm. and it's, it feels great. Like it just feels like a much more thoughtfully designed headset. But would you would you still, like how much of a, cause we're, we're comparing something like we're comparing them bin binarily, right? It's like one or the other. Right. But like, would you still recommend a Vive to somebody if like Oculus wasn't around, they couldn't get a yeah. pre-order for it? Like it's still a, a pretty substantially well-created VR headset? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's got the unfortunate thing that it has to go up against a product that came out last week. Yeah. I mean, these are the two like, you know, Sony aside, because they're in a different market, I think, you know, two high-end VR headsets come out in one week. You kind of have to talk about them in that in that light. But yes, it, I mean, it is good. It works really well. Like the 360 motion tracking stuff is is great. Um, it just needs more software right now to support it. And I think the headset needs a little more attention when it comes to design. Uh, last point on this. You've been playing with virtual reality for a long time, but you've been playing it quite extensively over the past fortnight. Yeah. How do you feel about the sort of long-term effectiveness of VR? Are you excited to go home and, and put the headset on? Are you excited to play more games like that? Have you felt like you've needed breaks from VR and you you just want to sit down and play a goddamn 2D video game again? Like, what is what is your feeling from somebody who was very excited about virtual reality right. before I had this experience? Uh, I think Rift presents a really good argument um, that VR is here because you've got developers making games that have had a lot of thought put into them and are you know fully fledged games. Even if some of them have just simple activities, the, the stuff that supports them is robust enough to keep you motivated to keep coming back. Um, there are some experiences like that on Vive, but for the most part, it feels like it's stuck in at like CES 2012. Right. Like this is VR. You can do this thing and it's kind of like a tennis racket and this is kind of like a tennis ball. You know, it, that, that I'm not as convinced by Vive, especially mm. because it's so expensive and it's ridiculous to set up. Like we didn't even get into the nitty gritty of the setup, but it's, mm. it's a pain in the butt. Um, for me, because it's so simple to use, because I know exactly what I'm getting into when I look at the games on the store, Rift is the best argument for VR um, hitting the ground running at this point. Cool. Yeah. Appreciate it, Peter Brown. Okay, can I what? leave? We have VR headsets coming out next week. <laughs> God. <laughs> we just got a pitch from somebody for an Android-based VR headset. Great. But it's not one that uses a mobile phone. 
Ooh, but, he uses, but he uses mobile phone tech inside of it. So yeah. get out of here. Can you call people <laughs> on it? Can you like just pick up the headset and stick it off your face and go like, yo, ma, I'm in VR. <laughs> Fuck off. You just slip what? your... You just slip you speak to your mother like that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how expensive long distance calls are? <laughs> yeah. Do they even have virtual reality in Ireland yet? <laughs> Ugh. Just FaceTime me. What a B. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't watch the show. It's fine. Hey, Mom. Sorry. Uh, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, Rob, you're here. We should probably talk oh. to you about video games you've played. Sure. Why I'm not? so sorry. So Don't be sorry, dude. We're, we're all friends of the Fallout universe. Yeah, the the Fallout, the Bethesda Fallout universe, the WWE universe. <laughs> I'm trying to think about. I hate the WWE universe. It's the worst acronym thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah. Vince McMahon jumping off things. Anyway, right. Fallout. You reviewed Fallout Four for Gamespot mm. last year. Uh, you've played a bunch of it. I played a bunch yeah. of it. Yeah, I've put 150 hours into that campaign, um, and I, you know, finished the Automatron DLC. Yeah. And then, I know you're getting at, <laughs> is the survival mode. Yeah, so this is what they, yeah. they didn't put into the game originally. It was in New Vegas, hardcore mode. They have a hardcore mode in Fallout 4, but it's just well, They, they like, called it survival mode, oh, but, it, did, but yeah. it wasn't... Basically, it's like this is like 2.0 survival mode, yeah. right? Like they added more things to it. Yeah, but the, um, what's coming out now, the beta, well, it's in beta right. now, it's coming now out it's soon, sure. is survival mode proper, which... Adds a significant amount of changes to Fallout 4. Like, not even like, oh, we've like made ammo carry, you know, has encumbrance Wait, again. Yeah. It's like, do the list. What, what do we got? So, the, it's, it's a pretty fat list. So, yes, uh, ammo now takes weight. Mini nukes that you carried around with, like, you know, not to take for granted, they're 12 pounds each. Right. Stim packs. You can't carry, you know, I think many people can agree by the end of the game, you have like 300 stim packs <laughs> yeah. and you're playing on very hard. Like I know I've heard people tell me this. You you can just spam your way out of it. But yeah, those have weight now. So you can only take like, you know, roughly 10 around. Um, wow. You now factor in hunger, thirst and fatigue so you can get tired. The only way you can save the game is by sleeping in a bed or mattress. That okay. are, and you see them everywhere, which is suspicious <laughs> to me at least. <laughs> Uh, and then the real kicker is there's no fast travel. And there's other things down the, that they tacked on, including, you know, you take more damage, you can deal more damage, um, and you get also things. So it, food, health, and fatigue factor your, your AP bar now, okay. which is like your VATS and your sprint. If you don't manage any of those three, it takes away like RADs due to health, so you eventually lose all those. So if you don't do anything, you can't run anymore in like... <laughs> In like less than you know twenty minutes, right. so you have to basically keep that in, in in check, and it also affects what they now introduce is your immune system. So right. yeah, I didn't talk about this in the video I I did over the weekend, but um, that also means that uh, animals who are um, poisonous or um, you can eat, basically you can like break your bones easier. Oh god, you can you can get illnesses like different types of illnesses which some of them can only be cured if you go to a doctor <laughs> so like you just it's a tough life out there and i love it i mean it, yeah it, it seems like they could have just done the oh we're gonna add in a bunch more you know health fatigue water management systems in here like we're in new vegas and like we're in the right. old fallouts but it seems like they've gone like full like the long dark on this where if you jump off something too high you'll break your leg and mm -hmm. then you have to walk the whole way, like taking out fast travel completely is like, yeah. holy shit. And, and there are things that I like really agree with or agree strongly with. And some things I think that could be toned back, like fast travel is pretty, br pretty brutal. Yeah. Like not to have it at all is real brutal. And there's no like a la carte menu where you can say, oh, I want like this, this is okay. But like, to, let's turn fast travel back on. Sure. And what I hope to come out of this is, you know, specific mods that cater to like breaking these, this whole mode, uh, you know, down to like mm. its core. But you know, you can at least, like, you could confidently say, like, okay, well, what about fast travel, like, a little bit? You know, like, in between settlements. or right. Witcher style. Or, yeah, mm. Witcher style. Yeah, posts, whatever. Um, but the but taking out fast travel, to me, was really cool in that, okay, now I'm looking at a map that, like, I can't just warp to an area I haven't been or, like, you know, close by. Now I'm, like, required to, like, explore again. Mm. Like, kind of like what the first third of your experience was, was like seeing all these cool new places. Yeah. But once you start fast traveling between them, you're not getting any of the random encounters. You're not mm. getting like a lot of this breathing world that eventually by the end of the game, you just don't, you don't see anymore. Yeah. And so like when I played just recently, I like had to go to a different area because the game still has like those side quests that are like procedurally generated yeah. where it's like, hey, I, judging by your map, 
we don't think you've, you've been over here. So now these things open up, and as does that lane that you've never seen before. So, like, I was, you know, 150 hours in this game, and I'm, like, walking through an area that I've never, I've never been. Yeah. And that, like... That's also, like, scary, though, right? Because then you don't super scary. necessarily want to go off the beaten path. Because, yeah. like, in your video, you had this yeah. whole thing where it was like, okay, you, like, woke up in the morning, so you had the most daytime, because at nighttime it gets, like... Harder or like so. You, I'm a scared. I'm I'm scared of the dark. Scared. And you like <laughs> brought, you brought like these weapons because you were doing this type of mission. Right. But then you're like, oh, there's a sewer. I'll just go in the sewer because it's a Fallout game and you do whatever the exactly. hell you want. Exactly. But then suddenly yeah. you're like, oh no, I shouldn't have done this. I'm getting that, like swarmed by people. I'm getting swarmed by people. Uh, I'm now drinking sewage because I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm that thirsty. Uh, that's what the doctor ordered. Yeah. Right. I'm, and you know that's the craziest is like the more you. The more you drink, uh, you know, uh, water that isn't purified, mm. the more rads you get. Okay, well then I think, all right, well I'll just pop a couple of these radaways. Yeah. Uh, guess what? Those make you insanely dehydrated. <laughs> so next thing you know, you're just digging a grave, and it's <laughs> real cool. And yeah, and the the, the craziest thing <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but the you know, it's a survival. I don't know. I love survival games, like you know me. So this like hits yeah. home. But like the other thing which I really adored was like, okay, now I can't carry as much goddamn ammo as I like. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, if it's the one thing that, like, you walk into a room in that game, you're like, all right, where's the ammo? I'm mm. taking all that. Right. I'm, I'm like, you know, souping up my, my abilities to, to get more ammo because I know I can just flip that, like, no problem. Yeah, sell it. Yeah, sell it. Like, no. You have to pick... I'm going through my ammo. Like, I'm taking, like, 100 bullets, 150 bullets for each of these guns because all I can, like, afford to carry. <laughs> and I get down there and I run out of ammo <laughs> so this is the coolest part was like i'm picking up a damn pipe pistol something that like you got over like within the you know first two hours of the damn game You're like <laughs> screw these pieces of shit i'm using this thing to like to survive like it was just wild i'm like how is this possible the game is making me use a crap weapon oh. like it's, it's, it's it almost wild. sounds like it's this cool. is the way fallout was like meant to be played that's the way i felt when he told me and i gave the game a nine i gave it a really high score but mm. like Man, I would have given it a higher nine. <laughs> <This stuff. laughs> and, and like touching on like uh, you know, the, the, I think I think what a lot of people agreed on was like why why do I need to build a base? Right. Why, oh yeah. This why was, right. am I building a base? Yeah. Like I was into it. I got you. You get into the idea, and then you're like, this is really janky, and I don't even know. Yeah. Like I'm just coming back here, and then to they're like, more my beds. crap up. <laughs> yeah. right. Like I'm just. And then they're fence. like, oh, build another one, build another settlement. Why do build I want to build another one? Like, Why would I want to build another one? Kind of a, you, like, I enjoyed it just for the sake of it, because it was like, yeah. ah, it's like a fun thing to do. But you're right, there was like no utility to it. And so then you realize, like, with this game mode, I mean, it's hard to say whether, like, this was, like, you know, on the back burner the entire time this game was made. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not going that far. But what becomes apparent is, like, okay, I'm looking at my map. I got Diamond City in the middle. That's a safe, safe haven. You know, Sanctuary in the top. If I just made, you know... Two southeast and southwest bases, I got my stuff covered. Now, I, now I don't have to go all the way home. I can establish those supply lines that they like try right. to incentivize. But like, who cares? Yeah, I'm going back to the same place every single time. So you just start realizing, like, all right, here is now a map that I'm thinking about routes and like waypoints and and making that efficient and, and mm. as far as travel and um, yeah, yeah, it almost like makes. All sense. that stuff makes way more sense, like yeah. in the context of the wider game. Yeah. Is there a benefit to sleeping on a real bed than to a mattress? Yeah, there. Are, uh, so there's like you know, if you can imagine the world, you walk into a building, and there's like just a mattress mm. or a sleeping bag. The sleeping bag would be the lowest of them. You you get so you get tired and you need to sleep. Uh, a sleeping bag will only take X amount of that fatigue away, just oh. like in real life. <laughs> eventually, you want to sleep in a real bed. Like I'm sick of this. Um, so you have to eventually to wipe that fatigue clean. You have to stay uh, or sleep in you know like a like a nice bed, mm. uh, like and a, like a California king. <laughs> right. What kind of thread count are we talking on the sheets? Over a thousand. Jesus. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough life. Uh, Jeff four hundred four says this is how this game should have shipped. <laughs> kind of yeah. feels that way, well, yeah, yeah. right? Just bits, I mean, just bits of it that seem like like everything as far as cooking, like you right. see cooking stations, like yeah. cool. Now, now you're like oh. Yeah, of course. Water, boil it. But of course, <laughs> now I'm making food. I'm making a sandwich because what else does it do? It eliminates my hunger and it gives me health. And it's and delicious. It, and it's less. <laughs> and, it's, and it's delicious. <laughs> and probably less encumbrance because you're taking all these individual items and 
combining them. Right, and like, certain, um, you know, like a death claw steak I think oh, gives you so like, much health. And not health, but like, uh, I think some type of perk, you know? Oh, like, really? Uh, Virility. <laughs> <laughs> Massive hands. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like you compare that to stim packs, like stim packs eventually seem like, well, why not go for the twofer? You're right. Right. Like, that, yeah, they, they give you so much more. Like, stim packs almost become less, like, uh, less important. Yeah, and also uh, another big one, which is actually really terrifying, too, like, where um, stim packs, uh, you know, again, like, toward the end of the game, you know, you got 300 of these things. You're just, you're just like, oh, as you're taking damage, you're just hitting, you know, mashing one. I'm <laughs> fine. Uh, quick save, quick save. One, yeah, one, right. Quick save, yeah. Exactly. Now, uh, I think the stim packs take, like, triple the amount of time. <laughs> Like so, two minutes. So work. when I first did it, I was like, "All right, no problem." Hit it, and you see your health like ticking away. The slow. It's like, well, I better get out of this fight then. Like you're booking it like out because I mean, the the combat just slows down significantly because yeah. you're just scared. I don't know. Being this, scared in in this game like had its effect. I feel like in the in the early stages, and then by the end of it, you got. I mean, you get power so early on. Yes, but also, I mean, you like, fight a bloody death claw in the first ten minutes of this game, right? Well, yeah. And also, here's another good one: is is uh, power armor? You can take a lot more weight, right? Like a lot. I think it's like almost double. And I remember thinking, like, all right, well, no problem. I'm I'm over encumbered. I'll just put on my power armor. It's like ten more slots. Oh, right. And so it's nothing. Yeah. So it's right. like nothing at all. Like power armor. Is just something that you can use as like a defensive measure. Like you're not like able to like carry more stuff. So does that mean you can, your companions can't carry like That's everything as well? Yeah. Right. That is diminished as well to the same extent. Where like you're you're already your inventory is cut in half. They yeah. can take about half amount of stuff oh, too. Great. But now you got these robots. Like I can go on forever. Now you got these robots <laughs> who like from uh, Automatron. Automatron, which are like again, like you play the single player campaign of that, and it's like all right, I'm done. Mm. Now what do I do? Now these robots are even like more essential because you start can like you know you get really nit- nitpicking gritty. We're like, okay, I'm gonna like pimp out one of my robots and just have this person just carry yeah. or be able to carry and just be like a you know like walking a storage like a mule. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Along. So you can like customize your like robots to pertain to that. Or like one of them, I um, the one I was using, I put on like um, a regenerating health field. Right. Uh, oh, uh, cool. Yeah. So like it, when I'm out of combat, she'll like. Uh, boost my health up. Oh wow! Automatically. So, anyways, sick. God, that's pretty cool. Uh, last point on this, I guess, is actually, yeah. What I want to ask you is: Does this is in beta? It's not actually. It's a free update. It's it's not out yet for everyone. Right. How did you Steam. opt into the beta? Was it difficult? No, it's it's. Oh, as far as like how to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's only PC. There's that right feature now. in like every game. You know, you go to properties and it's like the beta section. You just you turn it on. But I will say, man. It was rough it as far as bunch. crashing. Really? Yeah, yeah, like crashed the desktop like so often. I'm in the forums and everyone's just crying like, yeah, my saves are now messed up. Oh, God. Like, Actually, thank God. And so I finally got to work doing whatever it was, you know, like windowed mode. I don't even yeah. know. Yeah. Um, a yeah. bunch of just random stuff. But Windows but, XP compatibility mode. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> was really, really good. Uh, I got to work. But like, you know, it's, you know, beta. And what about the player level? Like, would, did you, would you start the game with this or did you go in with like right. a higher level character? No, I, I so I went in with like a level forty nine, right? Uh, and that was still really difficult to play. This game from a new save would be insane, right? Just like that first. I mean, I'm thinking up until power armor, like, yeah, that's gonna be rough. That's gonna be rough. That's it's cool. yeah, but it's totally like you know, if if the game for I feel like so many people like halfway through it just gets boring and not challenging, and yeah, you still totally. want to retain your character. Holy shit, this is the way to go. Flick it on. All right. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much for no coming problem. in. Talking about Fallout 4 survival mode. Looking forward to that. Let's shift gears over a little bit to another fondly remembered franchise. The Doom multiplayer beta was uh, was on last weekend, I think it was. This weekend? Mm, just, just, last, just this previous just weekend? Week, yeah. um, I, I got to play it for the first time properly. You played it back at QuakeCon last year, was it? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. What about you, Rob? You played some over the weekend as well? I played uh, roughly like four hours. Cool. Yeah, probably um, about the same as me. Yeah. Um, what were your initial impressions of it? I dug it. I... The pacing was nice. I mean, it was different. Like, I don't know. I, for me, as like a, I like a FPS as like just as much as everyone else. But like, I think what I've become tired of is like just dying immediately. Right. Yeah. And there was something about this game that like you know having health and armor scattered around was like okay, cool. Let me get like a nice streak in because that's always what you like really want from a shooter is like having a streak. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, skill needs to be a factor of it. But this game kind of prolonged like the combat, and I thought that was 
I mean, uh, just like you know, initial yeah, thoughts. Time. What yeah. type of you you play? You're sort of like you play a lot of Halo and Call of Duty and stuff right. like that, right? Yeah. So, uh, we're definitely Halo, not so much Call of Duty, but a lot of there's a lot of Halo in this. Yeah, yeah. If, I mean, some some of the like visuals in it. For me, I was really. I don't know, down on this going into it. I hadn't played it yet, but I was kind of worried because I'd seen a lot of the trailers. I'm like, yeah. oh, you're showing a lot of team modes here and it's looking very Space Marine-y and not a Doom way, more like a Halo way. Mm -hmm. um, and I did I did kind of enjoy it, but it feels very much like it's stuck in some sort of limbo between those two mm -hmm. games. So Certain Affinity is developing this uh, for id, and they're the folks who helped Bungie with, I think, Halo 4? I guess it wasn't Bungie. Well, they worked Damn. on Halo 4 and also on Call of Duty Ghosts as well. So they're sort of of that ilk when it comes to this that type of multiplayer. And like, there's a lot of stuff which is straight up from that that, that type of game, which is like you there are it's leveling up. There are loadouts. I mean, loadouts. you only carry two guns. You can pick whatever two they are, and then whatever sort of grenade or optional other type of uh, accessory. Um, I guess as well. Uh, yeah, the, the leveling in it. The what? Armor and appearances, like you know, like. Swapping your helmet out, and yeah, all and, stuff. and yeah. unlocking that stuff as you level up as well as, yeah. as sort of part of it. Um, and although it has like you know the the Doom type weapons, they don't feel like Doom, but what they felt like was kind of fine. Like I was enjoying this game on its own terms, but to me, it doesn't really really feel like Doom all that much. What did you think? Yeah, Peter? like I felt like it's been months now. I think this is back in July mm. that I played it. There were some like shades of Quake in there, especially when it came yes. to, to movement and things like launch pads. I thought those were really fun, and I and I enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I played just I think it was a single mode on a single map over and over again, you know, and it was in a controlled environment. But mm. I had a lot of fun with it. Like I, I really enjoyed the fact that it feels like a game f that I haven't played in a while. Mm. Even though like I can see where you guys are coming from with the, the comparisons that are similar between other games, the what it amounted to, all the parts together, felt different enough. Mm. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to like play this long term. It's going to come down to a lot of you know how much there is to do and whether or not it's it's fun to play. Yeah, I, I think the mechanics feel right for me. I liked the map design that I played on, but it, you know, limited impression. Um, I liked the what you're talking about. The sort of momentum in it was was pretty yeah. good. The uh, mantling was kind of <laughs> you're right. It feels way more quakey in that like you know it feels almost like quake you know. Uh, what you call it, the the hook mod, you know, where you're like right. g getting up to higher positions. That's what the mantling felt a little bit more like. Um, all the team, all the modes they've talked about so far, and all the modes that they've shown so far, and they've they've shown in their trailers as well, have all been team modes, which again doesn't feel very. I mean, that's not very quakey either, no. unless you're talking about like team arena, like that wasn't right. part of the sort of base level of play in this particular arena shooter. So like, it, like, and this revenant stuff as well is like super weird. I actually it? hate yeah. the revenant. Oh yeah, I think it's really stupid like let it let people find guns maybe like mm. i know it doesn't it's not really designed for that at this point but the revenant thing is just sort of like hey you're op you can fly you can kill anybody in one hit have fun yeah which is like great if you're the revenant but if you're not it's a horrible experience mm. yeah i mean like <clears throat> i'm a firm believer of like power weapons on maps like halo uh halo has always been like that, that's been my favorite thing right like everyone yeah. comes in at the exact same playing field. So right. you can see that chart in the end, you'd be like, that's that's me at the and top. And that's the basis of Doom and Quake as yeah. well, was like, unless you were playing like 1v1, was was map control and getting to the railgun or getting to the BFG or getting to the rocket launcher or whatever the hell it was you right. wanted to do. I mean, to be throwing fair, this in, right? Like, let's well, be fair, you do have to find it on the map, right? Like, it's not like you choose to be the Revenant beforehand. You have to find the pentagram sure. and transform into it. And it is a droppable thing, which at least is good. So there is some sort of incentive to, for everyone else to kill right. the Revenant. But, but it, like, it changes so much more than what a weapon would change. Yeah. Right? So, uh, Red and Dead says, can't imagine the player base on console sticking around for too long. This is kind of the thing about this where it feels to me like they're hitting some sort of middle ground between people who want like a hard, like I'm not sure if there's the audience for a hardcore arena shooter anymore, like Unreal Tournament's doing this thing on Al on the PC on Alpha, and I love that and it's good fun. This is, seems like it's trying to take that sort of like arena shooter vibe and then marry it with something a bit more mainstreamy. Right. But like you said, I'm not sure if there's enough in this for like a lot of people to yeah. stay with it for very long. Like, I liked a sample of the concept. Yeah. Do I want to order the full dish? Psh, I don't know. Dang. Eat that dish. <laughs> what do you think, Rob? What are your as somebody who does like playing sort of Halo, Call of Duty, yeah. 
big mainstream uh, modern shooters, online shooters. What did you think of this? Was this was like a novelty to it, or was it something you think you're going to want to play more of? I'll definitely play more of it. I I personally got a nice kick out of like the just bas- basically picking a loadout of like a rocket launcher yeah. and a shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to change it up. I like things with, it, with that change it up at least, and then still have that simplistic value. Like, yeah, seeing the Revenant. What's it called again? Revenant. Revenant guy yeah, flying Leonardo around. <laughs> it's just like, ah, oh, screw that dude. Like, I don't know. I just want to go around corners with a shotgun uh, and not have to worry about like going for these. These and we didn't even talk about like those. Um, what do you call those mods? Those, oh, those the hacks. The hacks mm. or whatever. The, I yeah. didn't get like a full like uh, grasp on like when and how those operate. Yeah. But like it was just another like thing I felt like thrown in was like wait what so yeah like, it doesn't pe- really f- pe- people can see me now or something like that whenever yeah. they spawn or like <laughs> now there's a guy who wants to like have my head <laughs> it's like dude yeah. it's a game like <laughs> yeah it was like, it, <laughs> don't it, take it so personally man they're like almost like Titanfall burn cards but instead right. of like, like, like benefiting you they sort of yeah like all it did was like it put countdown timers on the on the spawns or you could do one which was like the person who killed you you basically could see through fucking walls like you had a wall hack for that one person which kind of seems unfair it does. it's like yeah. unfair they killed me fair and square why am i now able to just like run up behind them basically and mur- murder them because you can if you get them like two rocket shots and you're dead right like two you know shotgun shots are dead i don't know maybe they'll tinker a little bit because of the beta feedback but i did enjoy yeah. it i did i was i was definitely playing it until like they closed that beta like wait what's going on yeah. Like, oh damn. Like, I <laughs> love to have kept playing, but um, yeah, I'm definitely on the fence as well. I mm. mean, it's definitely well said. Like, it's in a little bit of a limbo, like on the fence. Like, what type of game is this? Like, mm. I do see that that pull towards like progression. I I really get nowadays. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's got like I don't know. For me at least, like I do kind of want to see some like incentive to like. All right, well I, w- I want to look different. Like mm. I, I want a little bit of a pull toward like. <laughs> Even the differences were like the main differences seemed minimal. to be the colors, colors but, which you yeah. had all at the start basically. But yeah. The, the other ones was like you were basically changing fucking cod pieces. Like you couldn't. No one's gonna ever notice that. Like right, I will. <laughs> well, for, for Slayer you would right just um. Um, just one on one, what do you call it? Just just death match, right? If right. You're, if you're if you look exactly the same, opposed to like you know red and blue yeah. or whatever. But I don't even sure if they're doing normal. Oh, they better death match in this because really? all the modes that they've shown because they have one trailer where they literally mm. list all the modes. They're all team based. So damn, they have I this would, like God. I would be shocked. I'd be shocked. Do some sort of wasn't death match. How could yeah. they? That's Every like, game that's has like that. if a Street Fighter came out and didn't have arcade. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well said. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. My heart is about to say, no! Rob. <laughs> He's coming in a second. No! Uh, Rob Handlery, uh, Peter Brown, thank you as ever for your time. Yeah. Uh, we're waiting for Mike, um, for Rob Handlery to, to turn up. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. Mike, is he here? Is Mr. Ha- uh, here he is. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> Bye, Rob. Thank you so much. Mike, you put a shirt on. <laughs> Did I not have a shirt on before? <laughs> Just walking around half naked. It's great. You look great. When I get How are you doing, ticket? my friend? Good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. I'm doing. I'm having a great day. The show's running on long, which is good. We had a lot to talk about. It's yeah. good fun. Lots Enjoying it. Yeah. Nice. Have people stopped asking you to be Kevin Van Ord yet? No, not really. <laughs> Kevin Van Ord. Kevin Van Ord was uh was tweeting about that too. Yeah, he was. Yeah. 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 Um, he says he would have given Dark Souls the same score as you, so yeah. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully people can can back the fuck off and stop being weird about it. Yeah, uh, let's talk about Dark Souls three. Cool. So our review for Dark Souls three, your review yes. for Dark Souls three went yeah. up. Uh, was it a couple of days ago? Was yes, yesterday, yesterday. midnight. Was it yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, early morning. Cool. Eight out of ten on Gamespot.com. You've mm-hmm. been playing a bunch of it in yeah. the office for the past while. Uh, we've had you on to talk about it in vague terms. A yeah. bunch. I mean, Mary and, and Eric have been playing it a bunch as well. So it's been mm-hmm. chat around the office for a little while now. Sure. Um, eight out of ten. So I guess we got a bunch of questions for you from from the Gamespot audience. But what are your sort of main takeaways from Dark Souls? Where does this fit in terms? of the quality of previous games where does it fit in terms of a game a dark souls game coming out in 2016 when everyone kind of knows what the format is now sure uh it's actually really good this is probably a question but it's probably a good entry point for someone all right despite the fact that it's the third game in the what i think is going to be a trilogy what Mm. i'm pretty sure is going to be uh it's a great game i was you know it was it was bordering on being a nine for me but the more i played it and got into the late game the more it kind of lost its momentum for me and its creativity that the rest of the game displayed so well and I love Dark Souls. I love Demon Souls, Bloodborne. Uh, it just 
those there are certain games like Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne do such a good job of pushing you through the end game and mm. kind of making your progress up to that point worth it. And there's still very much worth it in Dark Souls 3, but it didn't really have that kind of climax and then really like engaging late game hours that I've come to expect from the series. Uh, something you were highlighting was something I, I was talking to Eric about last week as well, which was that there's a decent amount of repetition when it comes to bosses in yeah. terms of their like move sets at least. Well, yeah, each I mean yeah, I, I think I said redundant bosses because right. they're all kind of repetitive in a way, like when you start fighting them enough times. I think the most one boss took me was eight tries. Mm. It's a guy named Pontiff Sullivan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But yeah, they were pronounced Sullivan. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't gonna say it. <laughs> no, yeah, it something I try to like lend a little medieval flair to all these. Oh, nice, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I like Pontiff it. Pontiff Sullivan. So Sullivan. So, so so yeah. <laughs> and uh, no, but some there were about three or four bosses later in the game, one of which is the, one of the main bosses you're hunting down, one of the Lords of Cinder, as they call it. Mm. And I was playing them, and I realized I'm using the same exact strategy as I used against this boss, the second boss of the game, right. or the fourth boss of the game, or the first boss of the game. Uh, and they're all still really they're well-designed boss fights, but really heavy deja vu kicked in while I was fighting them and I was like oh I'm just staying between this one's legs which you know you play earlier Dark Souls you do that with a lot of the bigger bosses yeah. and a lot of the bosses who kind of thrive on the uh, those sweeping attacks like the 360 so that to kind of keep you off their side but you know I you start playing these bosses and you would like to see some more um, creative liberty later on in the game but it mm. doesn't it feels like they kind of I mean I'm not evaluating their intentions but it feels like it kind of the game feels fatigued after a while because you know, I'm, I'm repeating something I've done earlier, despite the fact that my character's gotten better, I've gotten better, I've learned a lot since I fought that boss right. four hours in as opposed to 20 where I am now. And that kind of, I didn't feel cheated because it was still, it's still really fun and there's still a huge reward in killing that boss, but it's still at that point, I, I wanted the game to reflect the progress I had made yeah. because that's the alluring thing of Dark Souls totally. for me. Totally, that seems but like the, the whole point of the series or the thing that people love about it yeah. so much is that it respects the player sure. and like teaches them, you know, like requires them, requires quite a lot of them in terms of skills. So mm -hmm. if you're saying that the end of the game sort of flounders in that respect, then yeah, that's gotta be a bummer. Sure, Ex except for like the last two bosses are really great. Um, mm. One's pretty, you know, without spoiling too much, the last boss, doesn't do anything completely new. But it's definitely a fun boss, and it, it was it's well worth. It it definitely makes sense to have that as a last boss, unless mm. you do you know barring any optional bosses of which there are a bunch. Uh, but the last like boss in the main story is also it's pretty creative in terms of how you fight it. So cool. yeah, there are there are some really bright points later in the mm. game, but not enough to really kind of push me through as much as like Bloodborne or Dark Souls One or Demon Souls did. Uh, Real Killer seven eight nine says the formula for the game hasn't changed a lot. Uh, I kind of want to talk to both of you about this. Uh, you know, the original Dark Souls, or I guess you could say Demon Souls, or Dark Souls, uh, and to a certain extent Bloodborne. These were games that you know were were doing something new, or at least doing something new for a new audience. And obviously, that's something that us as reviewers really like a lot. When or you know we play a lot of games, so when something does something new, I think we rate it very highly. And so does the the audience. Like people like when they're surprised in in a new way. Um, obviously, Dark Souls did that in in the past. Uh, I'll ask you. First of all, Peter, do you think that makes a big difference for a reviewer when now we're talking about, you know, it's the third Dark Souls game, but we've had Demon's Souls in the past and Bloodborne, they exist within this sort of group of games. That sort of trick doesn't ring as, you know, it's not as interesting as, you know, this far down the line, surely, right? It, it, it can't contribute as much to a wonderful, you know, game review because we kind of know that trick is it's coming. For the most part, when we're reviewing a game that's further down the line in a series, we find someone to review it who has experience. And and that's because we want them to have a discussion that is well-informed, mm. um, not to necessarily prop the game up against somebody who's going to recognize what hasn't changed. Um, that said, whether or not that's important is down to the individual who's writing the review. Yeah. I mean, I've, I feel like this has come to my table when it comes to like FIFA and F1. Yeah. And that there are like games that do the same thing every year. Right. And they do it well. And maybe they don't do enough. And right. maybe they do do enough. And it's kind of difficult to, to parse. I mean, my, my biggest criticism of, of Assassin's Creed Syndicate is that like, oh yeah, it's a, I get that somebody would really love this game. Right. But for me, I feel burnt out on this series. So that's right. the reason I would personally rate it so low. Yeah. And that's, and subjectivity is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So what what do you think about this? Does are were you happy enough just to play another Dark Souls? And I, and I I want to say as well, it is weird that we're talking about this when we gave the game a fucking eight out of ten because that's a really good review. <laughs> but there is this weird sort of backlash or you know sort of idea nine, on so the internet that yeah. it's not a nine or a These ten. Aren't school grades? People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fifty or sixty is not failing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. 
So what do you think about that in terms of you playing it subjectively? Did did this game do enough for you as a Dark Souls fan? Would you have been willing to play another Dark Souls 2? Uh, well, that's the thing. I think Pete and I had the discussion yesterday afternoon or something, and he said, yeah, reading your review, I got like halfway through it, and I was just thinking to myself, well, this could just be any Dark Souls game you're reviewing right now. <laughs> right. But then you get toward the end of my review, and that was my point. Um, Dark Souls 3, mm. despite a lot of the things that they've been kind of touting as new, it doesn't do that much new. The main new things I saw was in its structure and how you go throughout its world and how that kind of factors in. I mean, there there's the the new FP bar, which uh, dictates... It's your mat. It's essentially a mana pool for your uh, weapon arts, mm. and that was kind of an afterthought for me. Um, every once in a while, I would use them, and they are helpful, but it didn't really factor into how I was fighting. Um, Bloodborne has seeped into this a little bit. I think I described this as if as if Dark Souls one and Bloodborne had a baby, it would right. be Dark Souls three. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be a grotesque looking baby. Yeah, indeed. Um, Bloodborne indeed. <laughs> and um, <laughs> sorry. It doesn't. It doesn't do the same thing for me that Dark Souls One did. Uh, I think I still think Dark Souls One. Like, even looking back now at Dark Souls One, I think is still the best in the series, despite right. the fact, like, even removing any you know novelty from it. Like now that we're on three, it might just be that I'm tired of the series. I'm really not. I mean, Bloodborne was is, you know, it's not the same series, but it does so many great new things, and it. Uh, I'm more excited for a Bloodborne Two now than after playing Dark Souls. 3. Oh really? Yeah, but Dark Souls One. I mean, I can't. I actually just started a new game the other day because it came with like the retail copy of Dark Souls 3. Hmm. And it still does so many things better than 2 and 3. Um, I think 3 is like my third favorite. I think if I had to rank them, it'd be like Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Demon Souls actually, which is yeah. still a great game. Uh, 3 and then 2. All Not right. that I dislike 2. But yeah, I think in hindsight, it's weird looking back at one because usually, like you said, on the third of a trilogy, they have to kind of try to keep the momentum going as yeah. however they can. Uh, I still think one holds up better than any of them uh, right. yeah it's it's a great game and you know it, three a big thing with reviewing sequels is how is it different i don't think three is largely that different than the other ones yeah and uh that's not that doesn't make it a bad game it's still it's a great game it, i'm i'd be very surprised if we got to the end of 2016 it's not in my top 10 cool um but yeah i just didn't I didn't. I don't think it did anything really special like the other ones did. No worries. I uh, got a bunch of questions here about um, uh, uh, Hero at the Top and a bunch of other people asking general questions about frame rates, platform to play on, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, how does it look across the, all the platforms? Which one sort of r runs the best? I mean, as you can imagine, it run. It looks better on like a nice PC. Mm. Um, it looks good on all of them. Uh, the frame rate issues there were some, and they it dipped pretty low. But it was never in a time when I actually. It affected the game. The, the first spot I noticed it is when after you're approaching this boss and you kind of there are strong hints that you're about to go up against a boss. So I tried to backtrack to mm. the previous bonfire, and the game does this thing where it just a bunch of these skeleton bones rise up and create like something like thirty skeletons, and then the frame rate dropped. But I was wasn't really near them. You could just tell the game was chugging. Right. Uh, so that didn't really affect it too much. There's definitely I think it runs a little better on PC from what I've seen. Um, they did say there was a day one patch or a patch incoming that supposedly is going to fix them. And I want to jump back in. Yeah. I don't think it's going to really affect my review, but the frame rate dips never really affected me. I know Tamor in the UK is playing, and I don't think he noticed anything severe, although I am seeing other reviewers that had problems with it. Mm. Uh, and yeah, that's tough because, I don't know, it didn't really affect me personally, which I'm grateful for. But if the game isn't running smoothly, that sucks. But yeah, I'd say PC is... PC looks great, runs well. Um, it's not locked at 30 frames like the consoles are, but the consoles still ran smoothly for me. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so it feels like we've had this in the office forever. Is it actually out today or is it out next week? No, it's out, yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. The 12th. Next week. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Bunch of games coming out between now and E3, seems like. <laughs> yes, in that big window oh, of time, <laughs> there are many. <laughs> it's like two months. I thought you were going to say this month. I was like, there's not much. <laughs> no, not this month. I was just looking at month. May before I came on and it's bad yeah. well it's it's great it's, it's really great but in terms of like trying to play all of them it's yeah. bad yeah. yeah bonkers time all right well we had a packed show full of video games to talk about today uh so we better wrap this one up thank you so much to everyone who's been watching and listening really really appreciate it uh we are uh, this will be up of course as ever on itunes if you want to listen to it i mean you're if you're watching this, you probably don't also want to listen to it. But hey, I'm just throwing it out there if you want to do it. <laughs> the option's there. Uh, thank you so much to everyone in the back for helping with today's show. As ever, Mary Kish, Eric Tay, our man Dan Mahork. Thank you so much. And we will be back next week. We will be back but next week. But before the lobby next week, you can tune in to oh. Dead Air. Uh, oh, yeah. Plugging it. Perfect. Yeah, Dead Air. It's our horror podcast. Myself and Mary Kish are hosting it. Uh, I believe Pete's coming on this week. Cool. Yeah. Talking about some Very how... Smooth horror games are faring in VR. When's that going up? It'll be a Thursday afternoon. This Thursday? Two days from now? 
Yes. Perfect. Awesome. We also have a, a Vive live stream planned for Friday. And I also have a podcast. Oh, really? Yeah. The Peter Brown Experience? Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> returning the favor. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Rewind quick. Did you also know on Friday afternoons, speaking of air, <laughs> speaking of air, we have another likely titled podcast about a very different genre. <laughs> Pete, what is it? Alexa Ray Korea and I will continue uh, with episode three of Airship, our podcast that's focused on Final Fantasy, but Japanese RPGs and games in general. Sweet. And uh, it's a great show. Tune in. Tune in for the <laughs> release date of Final Fantasy 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can't just say Final Fantasy. That's, just like, that's a soft lob. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that should be fun. So that's on Friday? That's going up on Friday? Thursday, Friday? Yes. You think? All right, Thursday, Friday. I like it. I'm we also doing. have... No, those are the only no. two. We've <laughs> <laughs> got a bunch of stuff yeah. in the side. A bunch of reviews up as well. So if you want something to read, go check out GameSpot.com right now. VideoGames.com. Uh, as for live streams, we will be back on Friday. Thank you so much to everyone for watching and listening as ever. Uh, and if you don't watch the Friday show, we'll be back at 2 p.m. Pacific right here on The Lobby. Adios. <laughs>